So the question is, can poor room acoustics affect your guitar tone when recording a live amp? And also, can you just use sidechain compression on your guitars instead of doing all of this automation? Welcome to Viewer Questions Answered, episode 23. So before we begin, I just want to let you know that you could download my Guitar Impulse Response Octopack for absolutely free. Eight impulse responses, four different microphones, two mic placements per microphone. The IR pack includes impulse responses of two SM57s, two SM81s, two Sennheiser E609s, as well as two Electro Voice RE16s. You can have access to the IR Octopack for absolutely free. There's a link below in this video's description. So without any further ado, let's jump into this excellent group of questions submitted by subscribers. Okay, and our first question here comes from a user with a name that I can't read. But anyway, it's still a great question. Wouldn't it be easier to use sidechain compression on guitars triggered by the vocals? Okay, so what he's asking is a great question. He was commenting on one of my videos where I was talking about the importance of using automation on my rhythm guitars to make room for my lead guitars. And again, what he asks, makes sense. Why don't I just use sidechain compression instead of going in there by hand and writing an automation? Wouldn't that be easier? Well, unfortunately, automation and sidechain compression are two different things. The thing is, when you use automation, for example, let's say during a guitar solo when you want to just duck your rhythm guitars down, it's going to be consistent and linear to how you set it. If you use sidechain compression, there's going to be a lot of bouncing around and the level is not going to be consistent and you don't really have control over it. Now, sidechain compression works great if maybe you have a program kick and you want to make room for program bass and electronic music or even some crazy heavy gent stuff. But in the way that I'm using automation, I'm using it how analog mixers use it on a console, simply riding faders, making room and having control over elements that I want to be heard or to be less heard within a mix. In other words, playing my mix just as if I'm playing any other musical instrument. Side chaining definitely has its place, but side chain compression does not take the place of automation set by human beings with musical ears. So excellent question and hopefully this makes sense. Okay, and our next question here comes from Mr. Gaz. Hey Bobby. Semi-pro musician and hobbyist producer here. Have a lot of love for your channel having recently discovered you. Thanks for all the great tutorials and no-nonsense approach. We're working on those demos for album number eight and your advice has helped loads. So my questions, if you don't mind. You've mentioned about using both a drums and cymbals bus within your workflow. I just want to know whether you consider a room mic as drums or cymbals in a bussing sense. Also, any tips on getting a bit more cymbals in the mix, especially crashes? I'm using SSD5. Our drummer plays a MIDI kit for our demos, but I find that when I push the overheads too much, I end up with way too much ambience and sound of the other drums, etc. Any advice would be greatly appreciated and maybe some other viewers wondered similarly. Thanks again, Bobby. Gaz. Okay, well guys, these are excellent questions. Now, just for anyone who's watching, if you're not familiar with how I bust drums, I will generally have a cymbals bus and a shells bus, meaning kick, snare, and toms, because I don't want to over compress my cymbals. Uh, this can apply to parallel compression on my drums as well. So again, I will treat them independent of one another just so I don't over compress my cymbals because the drum shells can definitely handle way more compression. And it's just easier to keep them separate. And what Gaz is asking is a good question. Do I consider my room mics more to be my shells or cymbals? And for me, they're much more like cymbals. As a matter of fact, generally, I don't bust my rooms anywhere except for right to my master fader. I like a nice natural room sound that's not over compressed because if you over compress your room mics, you're going to end up with way too much cymbal bleed in your room mics. And it's just not something that works out well for me generally. So again, I'll take my room mics and send them right to my master fader. Sometimes I'll send them to my cymbal bus as well, but generally it's to the master fader. But in my mind, my cymbals and rooms kind of live in the same realm and my drum shells are completely separate. Now, as far as bringing up your cymbals and the mix and having too much room spill as well as drum spill in your overheads, it's a very common problem, even when recording live drums. And this is why I prefer to spot mic my cymbals so I get more cymbal in my overheads than anything else. Now, obviously you're using program drums, so you're not gonna have control over this, but most drum software that I've worked with, you can actually eliminate bleed or turn off the bleed 
in your overhead tracks. So check to see if your plugin will do that. Now, if you do this, then the issue is that your cymbals will sound really separate and really weird. And this is where your room mics in your drum software will come into play. And you can blend your room mics with your cymbals for a nice natural sound that's well controlled without too much drum spill in your overheads. Drum spill in overheads can work really well for other genres of music, but I'm not a fan of it when it comes to heavy technical metal. I generally just want cymbals in my overheads and nothing else. I get enough glue from my room mics and I approach program drums in the exact same way. So guys, excellent question. Hopefully that helps and let me know how it works out for you. All right, and our next question here comes from Jeremy. Man, you have been so helpful to me. I've opened a studio with a friend of mine and dude, when I found your channel, we were right at the brink of getting things rolling. So first off, I thank you for doing what you do. Seriously, thank you. Secondly, I do have a question. How do you handle releasing separate files for like a CD mix for download that isn't gonna get all abused by the streaming services and also a file for just that? How do you make sure that they get differentiated? Okay, well, Jeremy, excellent question. And uh, I'm gonna tell you the truth. I do not make separate files for these two different formats. I simply make one master file and the band will upload it to streaming services and it'll also be pressed to CD. Although I gotta say, in today's day and age, generally bands will do streaming services and vinyl. I haven't prepped a CD master in years, but even when I did, they're the same files. Now, with that being said, I do like to work with a mastering engineer when I have to prep files for vinyl because you can't have a screaming loud master with a ton of low end cut to vinyl. It can actually damage the needle and just won't sound that great on a record. It actually takes up more physical space. But back to your question and to be super clear, uh, as far as CD and streaming, they're the same file. I don't make separate ones. Thanks for your submission. Okay, and our last question here comes from Sebastian. I have never experimented with recording a real amp and cab setup. I mainly use amp sims and experiment a lot with IRs, but for fun, I might try it someday. One question, if I was to record an amp plus cab in my practice space, would the lack of sound treatment ruin my chance of capturing a good tone? Okay, well, Sebastian, thank you so much for this question. And I'm gonna be honest, my studio is a practice space. I don't have any acoustic treatment, just some basic foam on the walls. It's far from a professional studio and I still achieve the tones that I'm after. Now, with that being said, if your practice space is really, really echoey and you have absolutely no treatment at all, and like, you know, if you clap your hands, you can actually clearly hear the reflections. What I would recommend is maybe deadening your space with some furniture, simple things in the room, just to kind of break up and absorb some of the excess sound and reverb of the room. And also when you record your guitars, don't crank your amp to the point of deafening loudness. It doesn't have to be that loud. I prefer to keep my amp sort of at the level that I would have it during rehearsals, maybe even a little quieter, and I never have issues with phase or anything like that. But if you're recording in a very small enclosed space that has no treatment at all and there's sound bouncing all over the place and you crank up your amp, you are going to deal with some phase issues and possible comb filtering because the sound that's bouncing off of the walls will cancel at certain frequencies with the direct sound that you're recording at the microphone from your cab. But again, I wouldn't worry about this too much as long as you have something in your rehearsal space and your rehearsal space isn't super tiny and you're not, you know, blasting your amp at ridiculous volumes. Now, acoustic treatment is important, but unfortunately people blow it way out of proportion. And I can tell you with 100% certainty, you don't need acoustic treatment to record a great sounding guitar tone in a room. Think about it like this. Think of all the great sounding live albums that were recorded in clubs and spaces that were not recording studios at all. I've done full band recordings out of clubs, garages, bars, and some of those recordings are my favorite drum and guitar tones I've ever recorded, and they're far from professional studio spaces. So Sebastian, thank you for your question, and let me know how your guitar tones end up recording them out of your rehearsal space. Thanks again. So I would just like to shout out and thank everyone for this excellent group of questions. And if you sent me a question and I haven't gotten to it yet, just be patient. I will definitely get to it within one of these videos in this series. If you found this video helpful, like, comment, subscribe, and share. And do not forget to click the little bell icon so you can be notified every time I upload one of our weekly videos on all things metal and rock production. If you're interested in some Frightbox swag, we've got t-shirts, mugs, and a ton of other cool stuff on the way. There's a link below to the Frightbox merch store in this video's description. And again, remember, you can download my Impulse Response Octopack for absolutely free. Eight Impulse Responses, four different microphones, two mic placements per microphone. There's a link below to the free pack in this video's description. And until next time, Happy mixing.